Hello everyone, Federico here and I will talk to you about some MariaDB features that should be useful for a lot of DevOps. So who am I? I'm Federico Razzoli, I'm the founder of Vetabase. We work with databases, we do consulting and uh, we are specialized in automation. So a few words about this talk before beginning. Um, the talk is not an overview of all MariaDB features and is not a MariaDB DevOps tutorial. I will not teach you how to deploy MariaDB or take a backup. Um, it's not a list of well-known features or features that, in my opinion, are well-known. It is a list of features that you should know about if you are a DevOps or if you are a DBA or a developer or anything else and you care about automation. Okay, so I use the word um, DevOps because it's trendy, <laughs> of course, and because uh, if you know what it means, well, uh, you will agree with me that it's about automation. There is not much time about for, for uh, details, so uh, I will very quickly show the features I want to talk about. And then I really encourage you to check the documentation, find out more, and find out all the possible caveats that possibly I didn't talk about. So, First of all, should DevOps care about SQL and should they care about MariaDB very specific features? Well, when you work with databases, SQL is the native way to do things. Okay. Um, you may prefer to have, you know, layers of abstractions, tools working for you and generating the SQL in a transparent way. But in that way, you don't have much control about the details. And also, you know, these tools tend to do things in a non-optimal way. And they hide all the features they don't know about. Okay. Um, so basically, if you really want to do something optimal and know the details about what you are doing, you should use SQL. Uh, not necessarily always, but at least in some cases. So let's talk about the first feature I wanted to show that actually may be well known or maybe not, I'm not totally sure. And it's the statements show and show create. So Show statements allow you to show um, databases. Uh, schemas are just uh, um, a synonym for databases in MariaDB. Uh, you may be disappointed if you come from certain other databases, but actually I think that this is very practical. Or you can show tables or even columns or indexes or many other database objects. Okay, these are not all the show statements. There are lots of more statements. Check the documentation, but I, I will focus on these things. Um, this is a very quick and very simple example. This is what you get if you run something like show databases. Um, show statements are not completely consistent with each other, but they may have a from close and a like close or a where close. So for example, in the case of show tables, uh, as you can see, well, typically you show the tables from the databases you previously selected. Okay, as it happens in the second example. In the first example, I show that you can show uh, tables from a specific database. You can use a like close. So basically you apply a pattern. Okay, you get the tables that um, match a certain 
pattern. In this case, uh, I'm asking for the tables with the prefix WP. Uh, in the second example, I show that, well, uh, like is useful, but uh, not always enough, so you can use a proper where clause. Um, and in this case, I'm doing the opposite. I'm uh, looking for the tables that don't have that prefix. Then we can see that we have the show create statements. Okay, so what they do is to get um, the SQL statement that is needed to create that database or that table or that view and so on. In the case of a table, of course, you will get an empty table. Okay, so you can see the example here. I run show create table, database name, table name, and then I get a create table statement. And this is very useful for a lot of reasons, including a form of backup of table structures and moving tables around. Here you can see a simple um, example written in pseudo code. Uh, it probably took one minute or so. Um, so just to show you, uh, what it does is to uh, show, show the databases, show the tables inside those databases. Um, if tables um, match certain conditions, you run show create trigger and then you get the create trigger um, and you basically save it into a file. Um, so this shows that it's very quick to do things like, um, I don't know, there are triggers in staging uh, that uh, solve some kind of problem and I want to copy them into production. And yeah. So let's see how to copy a table in SQL. Uh, I've shown you two ways to do it here. In the first case, we run create table like to get an empty copy of the table. Okay, so it's the equivalent of running show create table and then run the, the uh, statement you get. And then um, you can run insert select. Okay, so insert into uh, new table name, select from old table name. This is the most flexible way because you can, of course, choose to only select some columns or you can specify a word clause to only get certain rows, uh, not all of them. Okay. Uh, well, this is useful, for example, if you want to create a copy with just a very, just very few rows for testing. Um, or you can just run create table select that basically uh, copies both the structure and the rows of a table. So in this example, I show that you can do this to create um, what is usually called the summary table, which means, well, maybe you have a query that takes time. It's complex, maybe. So you can create a table just to store its results. And then instead of running the, um, the query again, you will check this summary table. Um, it's useful if the underlying data don't change often, or uh, if they change, but you don't care too much about the latest data. Okay, maybe they are historical data, maybe you are just doing some statistical analysis. Okay. Um, all these things become more interesting if you know about Connect. Connect is a MariaDB only storage engine which basically allows you to create a local table 
which works with remote data. Well, actually, it does a lot of things. But one of the things is to connect a remote MySQL or MariaDB um, server. Um, not necessarily. It, it can actually connect to any database uh, if they support uh, ODBC or JDBC. And anyway, you basically write into a remote table or read from a remote table as if it were local. The only difference you will notice, possibly, is performance, of course, right? So here I've shown an example where I basically use connect to create a local table which connects to a remote table and then I use insert select to get the data from the connect local table and insert them into another regular table. Okay, uh, why? Because in this way I will have all the data locally. I'm a fan of doing this kind of things because there is not much round trip, right? <laughs> you just uh, read the data from another server and transfer all data to the local server. I don't create a backup, I don't have to copy the backup elsewhere, I don't have to restore the backup into a different server. So copying a table uh, in SQL, in my opinion, is always better, and copying remote data with connect is often great. Let's see about these nice um, this nice uh, syntax. Basically, create and drop statements have these clauses. I can run something like create table, create or replace table. So I'm telling, uh, okay, Miss MariaDB, please create this table. If a table with the same name already exists, trash it, destroy it, and recreate it uh, in the way I'm specifying. Or you can use create table if not exists, which is the opposite. So I'm saying, uh, Miss MariaDB, please create this table, but only if it doesn't already exist. If it exists, don't, uh, don't fail with an error uh, because it's expected, uh, just, uh, just produce a warning so the script execution can continue. For drop, I can do, for example, drop table if exists. Okay, so uh, if the table actually exists, uh, drop it. Otherwise, doesn't matter. Just produce a warning and uh, don't fail. Um, these statements exist more or less for all the create and drop statements. Uh, then we have alter table. Um, first of all, why is this useful? This is useful for you know working with um, database upgrades. Okay, maybe we have several versions of one database. We don't know if uh, a certain server has uh, version one or version two or version three. Uh, whatever it has, we want to make some changes, uh, make the desired changes to the database. Um, so I can use alter table to do things like, okay, alter this table, adding this column, unless it already exists. Um, but if exists, well, maybe it has a wrong type. So I can also say um, change this colon if it exists. Okay. And then I can do the same with drop colon, up index, drop index. And actually, uh, alter table has many more uh, options. So check the documentation, please. You also have alter table if exists. 
um, which is probably less useful. I mean, it can be useful in trivial cases only. Then we have something called, well, we have stored procedures and something called begin not atomic. Um, okay, of course, there is no time to teach about stored procedures here, right? Um, in case you don't know what they are, they are an extension of SQL language, okay? Instead of only having things like select, insert, uh, update, you have a procedure, procedural programming. You can use if, you can use loops, and so on. Um, one advantage of store procedures is that they are incredibly simple. I mean, uh, no matter which programming languages you know, uh, chances are you will be able to understand 90% of store procedures around. And also they run inside the database. So if they have to do things like um, copying tables, copying rows, um, create a new table from the result of a select, well, there will not be any data round trip, right? Data will remain, remain inside the database and will be processed inside the database. Uh, developers don't like them, typically. Actually, you should not abuse them. And actually, in MariaDB, they are slower than they should be. But uh, if you are automating some maintenance task, probably it's a good idea to use store procedures. Um, I mean, this kind of flows are probably not a problem in that case. Um, it's also worth mentioning that MariaDB implemented PLSQL, which is basically Oracle language for store procedures. Uh, it's still SQL, but it has um, many more extensions. Um, support is not complete, but uh, a lot of store procedures that work with Oracle will also work with MariaDB. And then I want to mention begin not atomic, which is basically a way to use a procedural SQL without creating a stored procedure. So you just put your code uh, in a file, as in this example. Uh, you start with begin not atomic, then there is the program, then you put end. And then you pass this file to the MariaDB command line um, client and it will run it. So let's talk about rename table and triggers. And yes, they can be related sometimes. Uh, you're gonna see why. Um, so, one interesting thing with uh, alter table is that you can use it to do what I call a soft drop. Okay, so um, you have a table called news. You think you can drop it. You think it's not used anymore. You are not 100% sure. You can run rename table instead of drop. Okay, so uh, you you are not actually deleting the table and its content. You are just changing the name. And after that, if applications fail with errors, because they are trying to use the news table, you can very quickly change the name again and everything is restored, okay? The alternative would be to take a backup, which takes time and that's fine, but then you would um, 
drop the table and then you would uh, get some failures from the application and then you would have to restore the backup which is slower and in the meanwhile uh, applications are still failing um, you can also do the same thing with columns and indexes um, in the case of the of a column the reason is the same in the case of an index um, well uh, similar reasons uh, i mean recreating an index anyway can take um, can take time um, it's worth noting that this is actually not uh, necessary anymore for indexes because now MariaDB has a nice feature called um, invisible indexes which I'm not mm, explaining I'm just quickly mentioning it so please check the documentation uh, one interesting thing about two interesting things about the name table are First of all, you can rename several tables with one statement. So in this example that you can see in blue, I'm doing three renames to basically switch two table names. Okay, so at the beginning we have A and B. At the end of this statement, we will have uh, A and B, which switched uh, names. Um, but uh, it's great to know that this is actually an atomic operation. So in no point in time, uh, A doesn't exist or B doesn't exist. So you can do this in production. This has some great use cases for DevOps and DBAs. I'm going to only mention the most obvious one. Um, the most obvious one is when you have to uh, run an alter table, um, also called migration in production. Why? Because an alter table could be a heavy operation for a server but this is another topic but it can also be a locking operation meaning that during the operation um, the table is locked and uh, uh, applications will not be able to write to it um, again um, sometimes it's not always true and uh, more on this later but suppose that a certain alter table is locking, uh, there is a way to still do it, avoiding locks, provided that you don't have foreign keys. So what you can do is create an empty copy of the table, run the alter table on the empty copy of the table, create triggers to reflect the changes to the original table to the new copy of the table currently empty then start to copy the rows from the original table to the new one in the meanwhile applications are still using the original table and they are not noticing anything when the copy is finished you can switch the table names okay and applications will suddenly start to use the new version of the table. Um, this is actually what uh, um, PT Online Schema Change from Percona Toolkit does. So uh, you don't really have to do this manually, but you should know how the tool works. Uh, Ghost doesn't do exactly this, but almost the same thing actually except that cost instead of using triggers um, reads the binary lock um, but I, I will not explain the details about these tools um, so let's talk a bit more about alter table because you know it's the typical huge 
pain in the arse of most DevOps. Uh, sorry for the technical language. So, as we mentioned, PT online schema change is lock free, actually almost lock free, but it may imply a lot of data copying. So, if you are running an alter table uh, on a table that is really big, well, you will copy a lot of uh, a lot of rows. It will take time, and the server may suffer, and then the applications may suffer. So, the good thing is sometimes it's not necessary. Because, as I mentioned before, it's not always true that alter table is locking. Actually, in the latest versions of MariaDB, the most common operations are usually not locking. This is great, right? Yeah, but things are not always that easy. So, one thing to remember is the exact list of lock-free operations or almost instantaneous operations depends on your MariaDB version. And also, if you have um, masters and replicas, uh, probably you don't have only one MariaDB version because you may have, I don't know, uh, MariaDB 10.2 as a master and then one replica with MariaDB 10.3, and then two replicas with 10.4, and so on. So, there is a great syntax you are seeing now uh, on this slide. Um, and uh, if you have only one server with no replicas, this is all you need, actually, almost. Um, but I'm not going to dig into the details. So after this talk, please check the documentation and understand all the caveats I'm not going to mention and all the details I'm not going to mention. But basically, you have an interesting close algorithm and another interesting close lock. Okay, so you can say, uh, okay, Miss MariaDB, do this alter table. Uh, but run, is, run it as an instant operation with no lock at all. Okay, of course, there is no magic behind this. So, um, it's not strange if you will get an error like, what? Are you kidding me? I can't do that. In that case, um, well, you know that what you asked is not, imp is not possible. So you will ask a slightly less desirable version of this operation. For example, you may say, okay, then please try um, to use algorithm no copy. So uh, there is surely no row copying. And use uh, maybe a shared lock. Well, now probably first you will say uh, use no lock at all. If you get another error, you will try another version. So, basically, the idea is you can try to have MariaDB doing the alter table in the way you want, and if it's not possible, at least you know what you are doing. Um, to to um, make things more complicated, uh, actually, um, the no copy algorithm was introduced uh, in a recent in a recent version. Uh, so even this command um, syntax may slightly change. So what will we do if we have uh, a replica chain? Well, we can do what we just talked about, uh, but we can do this one server at a time. So, for example, I can uh, 
before landing the actual alter table, I can run set session SQL log bin equal zero. So uh, the alter table will not be logged to the binary log, so it will not be sent to any replicas. But actually, you should start doing the alter tables from the replicas. Okay, you should start from one replica actually, because if the change you are making creates some disruption, uh, well, you will break only one replica, <laughs> which hopefully is fine. Um, so once you see that the change succeeded, you can do this on the other replicas. And finally, you can do this uh, on a master. Um, note that uh, when you do so, you should make changes in a compatible way. OK, so for example, if you are adding a column, you don't want all the insert statements to fail. It would be really bad. I mean, they, they would fail on the replica only. You will break replication for that particular replica. Uh, but still, it's not what you want, right? Um, but if you add a column with a default value or, uh, with, or if you create a nullable column, uh, well, null is the implicit default, well, this will not break the inserts. Um, typically. The last thing I want to mention about alter table is this wonderful syntax, which is uh, no wait or wait followed by a number of seconds. What is the use case? Well, maybe you run an alter table, but a select, a long running select, maybe it takes hours, is running and is keeping a metadata lock on a table. Um, so basically what happens is the alter table is blocked by the select. It waits until the select ends. You may think this is fine, okay, but select doesn't lock, well, um, there are always cases um, where things are different, but normally a select doesn't lock um, insert, delete, and update statements, but alter table does. So what will happen is your alter table will wait until select completion, and insert, delete, updates will wait until alter table completions, even if it didn't even start. So if you use alter table no wait, for example, you are saying, okay, Miss MariaDB run this alter table, but only if you can do it now. If there is a lock on the, if, you, if there is a metadata lock on the table, just fail with an error immediately without any wait. Or maybe more realistically, you can specify a number of seconds to wait. So, uh, let's talk about bin log format, because this is something that you should really know about, in my opinion. Um, bin log format is a variable which determines how the changes you are making to the data are written to the binary log. It can have three values, statement, row, or mixed. Statement means what it seems. So, it logs the SQL statements. Row logs um, a binary representation of the changes you are making. So um, the primary key or a way to identify a row and then uh, the new values to change uh, into that row. Um, typically, row is faster than statement. Typically means almost always. Uh, why? Because with statement, you run a query in the master 
and then the query needs to be run again on each replica. With row, the replicas will not have to run the query again. They will immediately know which rows um, must be changed and which values must be inserted. Um, mixed is basically use statement whenever you can. <laughs> But uh, sometimes you can't, you, you can't or shouldn't, because certain SQL statements may have uh, may produce different results um, on on different times or on different servers. Um, they are not deterministic. For, for example, in case you have an order by in your no, sorry. You have a limit in your uh, uh, in your statement, like delete from table X, uh, limit five. Okay, I'm deleting five rows, but if I don't have an order by, which rows am I deleting? It's not deterministic, right? Uh, in a case like this, um, uh, row will be used. So. Uh, I mentioned that usually row is faster, but uh, sometimes not. <laughs> um, take this query, for example. Uh, I'm deleting basically all the rows, right? Uh, actually, the query also has one more feature I, I didn't mention yet, which is returning. It means uh, it's a delete, but also a select. So I'm deleting these rows, but I'm also getting the rows. Um, so this can be useful for DevOps when they have to archive historical data and move them uh, from MariaDB to somewhere else. But suppose that yeah, maybe this, mm, this statement speed is acceptable because it's using an index. But maybe it's deleting millions of rows. And if we are using row, uh, well, it would be better to run one statement instead of looking for millions of rows individually and change them all one by one. Okay, so in this case we want to use statement, but the server is also is also used by uh, production applications. So we don't want to make the change globally. So we run set session, bin log format equal statement. Uh, we run our query, it will be logged as a statement. And then we restore the default. User statistics is the last feature I want to talk about. Um, first thing I want to say is it doesn't replace performance schema in any ways. You should have that performance schema enabled in production because it allows you to run some complex analysis that can only be run uh, with performance schema, okay? Um, like investigating some mutexes in the server and so on. But User statistic is a MariaDB specific feature which gives you basically information about the workload. Um, oh, sorry. Um, I should be fair. I said it's MariaDB specific, but it's uh, it's also in Percona server because it was originally developed by Percona. Um, so. You enable it by inserting this, uh, this option into the um, configuration file, user stat equal one. So when you restart MariaDB, uh, it will be enabled. But to enable it even before restart, you run set global user stat one. And then you have some interesting tables. Um, 
I will only mention two of them. Um, the tables are in the information schema database, which is a um, system database. And uh, the first table I want to mention is table statistics, which basically has statistics on table usage. Uh, so you have, of course, two columns uh, with the database name and the table name. And then you have three important information, which are uh, the number of rows read, number of rows changed, and number of rows changed multiplied by the number of indexes. Uh, these numbers are from the last restart, not forever. Okay, um, So if you see zero somewhere, it doesn't mean that the table was never read. It means that it wasn't read since the last restart. Anyway, you can use this feature to find unused tables that you can probably delete. To find out which tables need optimization, because maybe you can see that a table is written uh, much more often than any other table, so you want to make sure it doesn't have useless indexes, like duplicate indexes or uh, simply unused indexes. And then uh, you can also see if there are spikes uh, so if you are using um, a cool um, monitoring tool with, with some cool uh, visualization, for example, you can use PMM from Percona, uh, you can see a graph of each table usage. And if you see that the usage of a particular table suddenly increased, it means probably that developers um, just deployed some change to the application that makes a heavy use of a table. Why am I mentioning this? Well, I can remember some episodes where I seen this as a DBA after we were noticing that the server had problems. So sometimes uh, yes, sometimes you you don't have an easy solution. You have to find out uh, what's happening. Sometimes you have to optimize some queries, but sometimes you quickly see that uh, there is clearly a bug. For example, I remember a real case when developers deployed in production um, an application which had an infinite loop, which inserted rows into a table forever. And well, this is the fastest, fastest method to notice this kind of stuff. Um, the other interesting table I wanted to mention is index statistics, which shows, well, of course, uh, statistics on index usage. So for each index, you can see how many rows have been read again since the last server restart. Um, why is it useful? Well, you can see which indexes are not used at all, and you probably want to delete them. And you can see uh, which indexes are mostly used. And in that case, well, if an index is used far more than any other index, you may check if it has too many columns, uh, or the opposite, if it should have more columns to optimize some queries even better. So this was the last feature. Thank you for attending. I hope you enjoyed. Uh, hello, Federica, and thank you so much for a great presentation on uh, MariaDB features that all DevOps engineers should know. It was really interesting. And I'm really happy to have you here. And now I have a few questions. Uh, first, I would like to ask you, um, do you think that uh, DevOps engineers should uh, administer databases? Hi, Anna. So first of all, thank you for the opportunity. I always enjoy to make these presentations uh, for MariaDB server fests. So coming to your question, um, 
First of all, some people may get angry, but, uh, well, you know, DevOps already manage uh, MariaDB databases and all kind of databases. It's not my fault. I didn't take that decision. Um, if you ask me if they should, well, uh, maybe not, because it's better if databases are managed by people who best know them. And I'm sure that many DevOps will agree with me on that. Uh, many of them didn't choose to manage databases. So yes, DBAs, uh, database administrators, should uh, manage databases. But in my opinion, nowadays they should have a DevOps mentality. Um, what do I mean? Nowadays you need to automate. Uh, it's not like uh, 10 years ago when you had less servers, less different technologies to manage. Well, you have more tasks. Um, you need to make sure to um, repeat them in the same way every time. And you can do that with automation. And DevOps is about automation after all. Mm -hmm. All right, and uh, if a DevOps engineer does end up administering databases, uh, what do you think are main problems and uh, challenges uh, they would face? Oh, I think the most common problem is definitely with migrations. Um, I mean, they tend to call migrations, uh, you know, big alter tables on big tables in production because they are always concerned about, uh, you know, putting some locks on the tables and block the application, and then the application is on is not able to write, and writes will be queued, and everything will crash. Uh, <laughs> of course, it's a nightmare. Um, also, even if they know how to do it. Um, well, uh, they would like to automate it. They, they don't like to do it manually every time and automating it can be difficult. Uh, so yeah, that's an area where um, you need someone who understands uh, how MariaDB works, how logs works, um, which solutions you can use. Um, in general, um, of course, DevOps are comfortable in, in situations where things are linear because they don't know the complex problems um, related to, you know, some, uh, some MariaDB details or something that happens under the hood. Uh, ideally, the best situation is when you can read a manual page and then just write a procedure that does exactly what is described in the page. Um, situations where these may not apply is, for example, uh, upgrades. Uh, if you want to upgrade a server in production, especially if you want to upgrade a node in a cluster without having a downtime for the whole cluster. Uh, so yeah, mm, I would say that the two things I mentioned are the main problems they have. And they can solve them uh, with uh, more specialized professionals who understand MariaDB uh, or, or whatever they're using. Hmm. Well, as far as uh, migration is concerned, I hope you would have time to watch uh, Monty's presentation that we have at this uh, server fest. It's called the Curious Case of a Disappearing Commercial Database. And actually, he is uh, doing this kind of Agatha Christie uh, story on uh, migration uh, huh. process, uh, how people come to MariaDB. So do have a look. It might be uh, useful, I think. And a uh, final question to you is that... Um, I mean, you are practically a veteran of uh, our MariaDB server fest. You've been uh, doing all kinds of great presentations for us. And uh, in particular, you were talking about uh, automating MariaDB uh, with uh, Ansible. So uh, now you are talking about uh, native SQL features. And I'm wondering, what do you say now? Should Ansible be used or not? Ah, yeah. Um, well, yes, Ansible should be used. If not Ansible some alternative that you may prefer. I mean, someone could choose to use Puppet or Chef or Salt, and that's fine. But the idea is use some 
um, automation software of that time of that type, um, but don't necessarily use it at the highest level. I mean, Ansible, for example, has a lot of um, modules. Um, like, for example, um, I don't know, MySQL database, and uh, y you could use it. Um, but what is the benefit? I mean, you can also write your queries. Sometimes it's even simpler. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, the drawback is if you use the modules, uh, you will use Ansible in an I'd important way, which is the purpose of Ansible, which is part of the purpose of Ansible. And yes, but sometimes all you have to do to be important is just to ignore errors in case you get them. <laughs> uh, so definitely um, understand SQL, use it whenever it gives you more power or whenever it eliminates, you know, uncertainty because sometimes it's not 100% clear what will happen if you tell a certain module to do something. You will not know which queries it will run in details. Okay. Um, so yeah, use a combination of both. And the question may become slightly more complex in the case of startups that currently don't have any automation in place. And they will say, oh, yes, but uh, implementing, you know, some Ansible inf infrastructure may be complex, especially for us because we don't have the specific skills. And then my advice is, okay, build that skill with time and in the meanwhile start to automate in some trivial way start by simply building i don't know some simple uh, bash or python scripts uh, doing stuff uh, and then when those scripts are not enough anymore you will turn them into ansible playbooks Okay, thank you so much, Federico. It was really interesting, and um, I hope we can do it again in our December server fest. But thank well, you. Absolutely.